When we ended last week, we're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, which verses mark the end of the, the central exposition of the book on the high priesthood of Jesus. So we have that section, 10, 19 to 25, has a lot of verbal parallels with chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, which is a, is a, is a way of indicating, it's a literary device called an inclusio, and it's a way of indicating that those two sets of verses, 414 through 16 and 1019 through 25, that those two sets of verses are the beginning and ending of a larger section. So that we, that, that's been the central section, and it's ending here in 1019 through 25. And 1019 through 25, they also serve as an introduction into uh, the fourth uh, interjection of exhortation. If you've been following how I am looking at this, you have, you have this exposition and in, in, inserted in there, interjected in the exposition. You have these sections of exhortation. Well, the last section of exhortation runs from 1026 down to chapter 13, verse 19. So 1019 to 25 not only close out the main section that you have, the exposition on the high priesthood of Christ, it also serves to introduce the fourth and final section of exhortation. Now, 10, chapter 10, verses 19 through 20, 22, the writer exhorts the hearers to draw near to God, and he bases that exhortation on the fact that Christ died as the true and fully efficacious sacrifice for sins and serves as the great high priest in the immediate presence of God in heaven. So he exhorts us, he says, draw near to God. He bases it on the fact Christ died as the true and fully efficacious sacrifice. He is ministering in heaven in the very presence of God. And that provides all the confidence we need to heed the exhortation to draw near, to come close to God. And that is something that we as Christians need to do. Okay, certainly in our worship and our praying that there needs to be this approach to God and this intimacy with God. So he exhorts them to do that. And the manner in which they and we are to draw near to God is with a true heart and in full assurance of faith. Okay, then there are certain conditions that he assumes for the drawing near, for the condition the, you know, that he assumes for this exhortation, and that he assumes these have been met, and namely that the hearer's hearts have been sprinkled or purified from guilt by the sprinkling of Christ's blood and that the, their bodies have been immersed in, the, in water in the rite of baptism. He just assumes those conditions have been met in those he's exhorting to draw near to God. Baptism is where one by faith receives the sprinkling of blood that cleanses the conscience. Okay, and we, walk, we talked about that, but you know how I, like, I just kind of like to pick back up with you know, the flow. Okay, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to track the flow, the writer's flow of thought as best I can, and I, so I try to reset the context for you before we carry on. Chapter 10, verse 23, he encourages the hearers to hold firmly to the confession of the Christian faith, the confession of hope, without wavering under the pressures they were facing. If you remember, that they're having pressures like I suspect we have never experienced. You know, we've grown up in, you know, a, quote, Christian society that until fairly recently was uh, rather hospitable to the Christian faith. And we just have never experienced the kind of thing that I suspect these hearers have experienced where, you know, the, the, the Jewish, they're, they're coming from some Jewish background and you have Jews who are uh, ostracizing them which meant, you know, economic difficulties. If you're part of a Jewish community and you're a disciple of Christ and then the Jewish community turns its back on you, well, you know, you're not, you're not going to be getting the same jobs. You're, go you're going to be left out of things. There's tremendous social and economic pressure put on you. And then there also, if we're right in the Reconstruction, that this is written to uh, Christians in Rome, we're probably talking about the mid-60s, so we're right on the verge of a, uh, a tremendous outbreak of persecution when Emperor Nero basically lost his mind and was very hostile toward the Christians. So they also have a, a government, a society in that way that is hostile to them. And the straws are in the wind that they're going to be... And so you can see they're facing a great deal of, of pressure to abandon their commitment, to go underground at least in their faith. 
and to say, you know, I'm not going to publicly identify with Jesus because that brings a great price. And I don't want to do that. Well, in 1023, he tells them to hold firmly to their confession without wavering. He tells them, listen, God is faithful in all things. So those who remain steadfast in their allegiance to Christ can be certain that they will receive all that's been promised. And we have to tell people that. We have to get people to see that, that God is faithful in everything he said. You hold on to Jesus. I understand this world is difficult. I understand you're being pressured. I understand there's a temptation to want to turn loose and focus on the here and now and say, listen, I don't want to do that. I I want to come over here because I'm being threatened by the government and they don't recognize Christianity as an authorized religion and I can get in a lot of trouble. And all my family and friends and all these people, they're leaning on me and it's just a bummer. It's a grind. And so there's this temptation. He says, you hold on to Christ. God is faithful. He, you will not have held on to him and on that day having parents say, you know, that, that wasn't really true. I was just kidding. That's not going to happen. Okay? You be steadfast in your allegiance to Christ and you'll receive all that God has promised. And when we, we were looking at uh, chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 when we ended. I want to say just a little bit more about that. He says, and let us consider. Okay, so he tells them, look, in 1023, he tells them to hold firmly to the confession without wavering. Hold firmly that and let us consider one another for the stimulation of love and good works, not neglecting our own assembly, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. See, as I said last week, I think he's exhorting them to be conscious of the group. Okay, when he says, let us consider one another, I think he's exhorting them to be conscious of the group so as to be moved by that awareness, that corporate consciousness to stimulate love and good works among the members, which things serve to strengthen the bonds of the fellowship and thus to bless the group by counteracting the forces that pull one from the faith. Okay, he, he's focusing on their need to be encouragers of one another. Okay, he's already spoken of the need that they have. Listen, you need to hold firmly... That's your responsibility, but we have a responsibility to one another to be encouragers. Rather than neglect the meeting of the saints, as some were in the habit of doing, they're to encourage one another. Now the fact he contrasts not neglecting our own assembly with encouraging one another, it indicates that his focus is on the discouraging aspect of neglecting the assembly. He says not neglecting our own assembly, but encouraging one another. See, that says to me that his focus on this not neglecting our own assembly is on its discouraging aspect. You see, don't, don't, don't do that, but encourage. Don't neglect so as to discourage. Be faithful in it so as to encourage people. He's combating, at least as I see this, he's combating the temptation that some may have to join the ranks of the defectors by cutting off this rationalization that says, listen, whatever I do in the assembly, and if I blow off church, and if I'm a defector, that's only between, you know, that's between God and me. That's this personal thing I've got between God. He's cutting off that rationalization by letting them see it has bigger implications. Okay? You're abandoning the body of Christ has harmful consequences for other believers. Okay? And as, as David pointed out last week, A lack of faithfulness on the part of others, it doesn't justify or excuse a lack of faithfulness on our part, right? I mean, we're called to abide in Christ if we're the last person on earth to do that, right? If everybody's faithless, we're called to abide in Christ. The the writer of Hebrews wouldn't dispute that in the least, but if I'm reading him correctly, he's shining a light here on an underappreciated harm of abandoning the assembly. And that is that it has a discouraging effect on people. And that's why I was talking about the military. We understand it well in that context. Now, he says we're to, we're to, we're to be about encouraging one another, a subset of which is, to, is we're, to continue, we're to continue attending the meetings of the saints. That's a subset of this idea of encouraging one another. He says we're to be about encouraging one another. And then he adds all the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, I want to say a bit about that, and we'll move into the next section. See, they're to be all the more conscious of encouraging one another as they see the day of judgment approaching, the day of Christ's return. See, they and we, 
see the day of judgment approaching, coming nearer, when we see Christians suffer for the faith. I'll explain that in a second. But see, when we see righteous suffering, Christians who suffer for their faith, we are seeing the day of judgment draw nearer. Okay, and he's saying, listen, you need to be all the more about encouraging people when you see that happening, when you see the faithful saints suffering because of their faith. That is not the time. See, they're being persecuted. That's not the time for you to shrink back and say, hey, I will, I will lighten up on encouraging people. That's the time to intensify encouraging people. That's not the time to abandon the assembly when the, when the body is getting persecuted. That's the time to double your effort to be faithful to the assembly because it has an encouraging effect and it is needed when you're being persecuted. Okay, he says, all the more when you see the day approaching. Now, the day draws near. It draws nearer each time Christians suffer for their faith because there's a set quantity of righteous suffering that will occur before Christ's return. There is a predetermined quantity of righteous suffering that is going to occur before Christ's return. And you can see that, I think, quite clearly in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Okay, we have the people, the martyrs there, and they say, how long? And he says, well, till the full number come in. Okay, so you have this idea of there's a set quantity of suffering, and with each episode of Christian persecution, there's that much less of that set quantity of righteous suffering to be experienced, so the day of judgment has moved closer by that much. You see, if I have a set quantity of righteous suffering as we are being persecuted, that set quantity is being eaten up and the day is drawing near whenever I see brothers and sisters suffer for their faith. See, whenever they're being persecuted and these guys are being persecuted and he's saying to them, now's not the time to sit here and say under persecution, well, now I need to be lax in my encouraging. No! When, the, when, when you're being persecuted, you need to be really on the stick with encouraging. Okay, and you see that you see it drawing near here. This is the idea behind Paul's statement, you know, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, where Paul says, he says, Now I rejoice in the sufferings on your behalf, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Well, obviously, Paul's filling a deficiency in Christ's afflictions doesn't mean that Christ's death or his suffering lacks anything in atoning or reconciling efficacy. He clearly doesn't mean that. You can see in Colossians 1.20, Colossians 1.22, he's not talking about that. So what, what is he talking about here And that he fills up in his flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions? Well, the Jewish idea was that the Messianic age, it would be preceded immediately by the suffering of God's people. And this idea continues in the New Testament, but it's modified. It's modified because the coming age has already been inaugurated. I've said this many times. I hope it's sinking in that the coming age is already a present reality. It was inaugurated with the coming of Christ. The kingdom of God is a present reality. It is, it is as though the not yet has been pulled into the now. But it is not the sole reality. We now live in an overlap of ages where the kingdom is a present reality, but also the old age or the old order continues. That is why here you see suffering, sorrow, mourning, and pain. But a day is coming when Christ will consummate the kingdom he inaugurated, and then all that is contrary to the eternal purposes of God will be stripped out, and the kingdom of God will be the sole reality through eternity. Okay, so when he, we have this same idea in the New Testament. You have, it's modified, okay? The dual state's going to continue until Christ's return, and the woes of the Messiah, the afflictions of Christ, continue during this overlap of ages. The kingdom is a present reality with Christ's coming. He inaugurated it. It continues for a period of time overlapping with the old age or order. And during this period of time of overlap, the sufferings of God's people continue, and they will continue to their appointed limit. And at that time, Christ will return and consummate the kingdom, the age to come. 
And I think, see, this is what Paul is talking Paul rejoices because his bodily sufferings contribute to the total sufferings to be endured before the consummation of the age to come. He rejoices because he's helping to fill up the predetermined measure. He brings the end that much closer, and by absorbing a disproportionate share of that suffering, he is sparing others of it. So that's what I think he's talking about in Colossians 1.24. That's what I think the writer here is saying. He says, listen, you be about this encouraging stuff all the more. All the more as you see the day drawing near. And he's telling them that in a context of persecution. So his point as I see it is, listen, now's not the time. It's never the time to, to abandon the assembly or to cease encouraging brothers and sisters. But especially... When you see the day drawing nearer through the absorption of this persecution. Okay, that's what I think he's talking about. And I didn't get to say that last time, but now on we go. Okay, 1026. Now we enter into this, the fourth and final hortatory interjection. Okay, this interjection of exhortation runs from 1026 down through chapter 13, verse 9. And it begins with the fourth warning. Okay, there have been a, there are a number of warnings put out here, and here's one of them. Okay, he says, for if we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think the one who trampled on the Son of God and considered a common thing, the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and insulted the spirit of grace will deserve. For we know the one who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, encouragement is so important in light of the coming judgment. Because a Christian who is pulled from the faith into rebellion, who turns his back on God and walks in impenitence, will be condemned to hell. This is, you know, this is no small potatoes. That this is, this is the consequence. If one is drawn from the faith, turns his back on God and walks in impenitence, his fate is going to be destruction. The person is going to be condemned to hell. And so, so you see how serious this is. So he's telling them, listen, you need to be about encouraging, not neglecting this, but encouraging. For if we deliberately keep on sinning, you see there is a consequence that your encouragement can help to avoid. Now the ultimate responsibility, I understand, is yours, mine. But d don't you think we have an effect on one another? We have an effect on one another, and we have to take that seriously. You can't just say, listen, I'm me, I'm mine. I don't want to mess with anybody else. What do I care about other people? You know, I'm in, I'm doing fine. Let them sail. Well, see, that's not part of brotherhood. You see, that's not part of brotherhood. So, you know, encouragement's important because this is what happens if somebody turns leaves the faith and walks in impenitence, they'll be condemned to hell. And by rejecting Christ, see, which is implicit in being devoted to sin, right? I mean, if you are devoted to sin, you have rejected Christ, right? I mean, those things are contradictory. I don't sit here and, sit, you know, and say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for dying for me. I'm all yours. And then turn and live in sin. Okay, one of those things is false, right? I mean, I'm just giving lip service to it. So when he talks about this idea of living impenitently, walking in sin, implicit in that is the rejection of Christ. By rejecting Christ, one rejects the only sacrifice that exists for sin. If you reject Him, the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice, the true one to whom all the shadows of the Old Testament pointed, if you, if you reject Him, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Yeah, that reminds me of this story. Somebody, I forget who, who said that. I think it was uh, Wesley was talking to somebody. And the guy said uh, something to the effect, I don't believe in forgiving people. And Wesley said, well, sir, then I hope you never sin. You see, because if you want to be forgiven, 
You better be a forgiver. You see? But this idea, so, so if, if you want to reject Christ, well, then I hope you never sin. Because if you reject him, you've rejected the only basis of forgiveness. Okay? You want to turn your back on him and say, hey, I'm out and all that stuff, and I'm going to walk in impenitence, I'm going to blow you off. Well, fine, you've just cut yourself off from the only sacrifice that matters. Okay, the only sacrifice that matters, and you see the consequence. Now, the writer is not, he's not here concerned, in my judgment, with the finer question, okay, of, of whether the damnation under which one puts oneself by abandoning Christ is in all cases unalterable. I don't think that's his issue here. Okay, he's not addressing that finer question. He's using the danger of eternal damnation to exhort his hearers to take seriously the need to encourage one another. And of course, indirectly to warn the wavering. But he's using this thing of this, this risk of damnation to exhort them to take seriously this need to encourage one another. And all he needs for that purpose is for his hearers to appreciate that the default consequence of abandoning Christ is damnation. You abandon Christ and without something else, you're lost. Okay, now the fact that some people, you can abandon Christ and go beyond the point of, you can fall beyond repentance, as he made clear in chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, well, that simply increases the urgency of helping the saints to remain faithful, right? That doesn't decrease the urgency. That increases the urgency. So it's an important thing, and this is something, an obligation, a responsibility that we have to one another. So we just have to take it seriously, and he wants them to take it seriously. Because the stakes are high, and we have an effect on one another. Okay, so this notion that we can just act, I'm an island, and who cares what my conduct does to other people? That's when I hear these, you know, religious types, molesting people. Okay, I just want to hang myself. What are you doing? You're wearing the name Christ in this world? You're wearing the name, do you know what you're doing to people? It's just nuts to me, but it's everywhere. Okay, and you and I individually have influences on people. You have influences on your children. You have influences on other people. And don't think you can just say, well, listen, I'm me. What they do is themselves. No, you influence people. And you must be a light everywhere you are, whatever you're doing. Live for Jesus Christ. So that when people who've had contact with you, they wind up saying, listen, I'm not sure about who this Jesus is, but I'm telling you, whatever he's done to this guy, I like it. He's made him better, holier, purer, nobler. Husbands, your wife ought to be saying, hey, I wouldn't trade a Christian husband for anything. That's how it ought to be. Okay, wives, the same thing. Your husband ought to be saying that. You see, this is how we're to be, drawing people a light, influencing people, taking faith seriously in everything we do. And this is, he's speaking in a congregational context here. Now, given that, that rebellion against the law of Moses, he says, look, given that you had rebellion against the law of Moses, rejection of the old covenant, given that that was punished by death, Okay, and you can see in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 2 through 7, chapter 13, verse 8, for a good idea of what he's thinking about when he says that. But he says, given that you had this rejection of the old covenant, rebellion against the law of Moses was punished by death, well then certainly those who rebel against God under the more glorious new covenant that he's just spent chapters talking about. He's spent chapters talking about how wonderful this new covenant is, how superior this new covenant is. Well, if people who rejected the law of Moses, the old covenant, died, he said, what do you think is going to happen to people who take this glorious new covenant and trash it? What do you think is going to happen to them? Certainly they deserve an even greater punishment. He says, look, in doing that, in treating it this way, they are showing contempt for Christ. Trampling the Son of God. That's the picture of that. You know, we get that picture sometimes, putting your foot on somebody, trampling the Son of God. You're treating Him with contempt. He says, think about that. 
trampling the Son of God, treating him with contempt. And he's worthy of what? Greater honor than Moses. He says that the people who rejected Moses, if they died, well, here's this glorious new covenant. You're treating with contempt the Son of God who's greater than Moses. He says in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, so he says, what do you expect is going to happen? How do you think God is going to respond to that? Who are the people who are treating the blood of his sacrifice as though it's not the least bit special. That's what he means here, you know, this idea you've trampled the Son of God and considered a common thing, the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. The blood of Jesus Christ, to treat that sacrifice as though it's just junk. So what? Who cares? I mean, it's just, it's just nonsense. It's just junk. <laughs> You see what he's telling them, listen, look at the danger here, who've who've treated, you know, as something not the least bit special, the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who've insulted the Holy Spirit whom God graciously gave them. Who in his right mind wants to be in that position? Now, I'm convinced if we can get people to see that, okay, if we can get people to see this and understand it and believe it, well, that's going to have draw on people. Why don't we tell them that? Well, how are we going to keep people around? How did the Hebrew writer keep people around? The Hebrew writer told them, he said, listen to this. If you abandon Jesus Christ, this is what's in store. Okay, I mean, do you even want to treat another person like this? Where you're just treating them like dirt? Let alone the Son of God who's given His life for you. And look what is in store. Do you see how God is going to respond to your rejection, your spurning of His tremendous gift? Well, we need to tell people that. When we tell people that, what's our response? You don't want to tell people that. That's negative. That's harsh. No, it's loving to people. Because you're trying to wake them up to say the, see the danger they're flirting with and turning from Christ. Was it unloving for the Hebrew writer to say this? If I say this to somebody, does that make me mean? I don't get it, I'm telling you. I absolutely do not get it. Other than I think we've sucked up the culture that has relativized everything. Is it? You, you can't say that to anybody. You can't say that to anybody. You can't really, you know, you, you don't want to talk that way to people. Well, I do if, they're, if their eternal life is at stake. I want to tell them. Now, I'm going to sit here and I'm not going to scream at them like I'm screaming at you. But, you know, I, I want to tell them. Because this is serious and important. You know, this isn't, you know, we just have to get them to see it. Now, some of that, I think, may require some, some rebuilding. Because my opinion is, is that so many in our culture have lost conviction in the truth of the Bible and the Bible story. Now, they still come to church, but they won't tell you that. But they have lost conviction in the reality of the story that is revealed here. It starts with creation, because and this is a hobby horse of mine, and I won't ride it right now, but I will say it starts with creation, and everybody's saying, listen, uh, no, 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 you know, that Bible stuff is fine, but look, you came from nowhere out of nothing by chance, and all the big guys know that, you see, all the smart people in our culture, and we have to recognize, you know, that science, look, there is, a, there is a thing about, you know, science fights to maintain its preeminence in our society. Okay? It has for a long time, science with a capital S, it has for a long time been seen as the, the oracle of Delphi. This is where you go for any real answers. Religious folk, you know, they're just talking nonsense. But if you really want to know something, you go to the guys in the lab coats. Okay? So that is a position of power in the culture, and when anything threatens that position, that says, no, 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 this is real, this is what's being told to us, the Bible is true, okay, and the story you're painting is not true. Well, then there's a tremendous assault on that, and that's what you saw, some of you saw the documentary Expelled, which deals with the intelligent design people, anyway, I won't get off on all that, but, all right, let me move on here. Verse 32, now this section, 32 to 39, is really a block but I busted it up just into a couple of sections here just so I can uh, talk about it more sanely here. He says, 32 to 34, but recall the earlier days in which after having been enlightened, you endured a struggle of suffering, sometimes being made a public spectacle by both insults and afflictions, and at other times being partners with the ones who were so treated. 
For indeed you sympathized with the prisoners and welcomed with joy the seizing of your possessions, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and an enduring one. Okay, now this is, this is a, yeah. to me this is, is potent stuff here. I mean, all of it is. But when you think about this and you put yourself in the position of real people, sometimes we read stuff, we just say, you know, it's like they're literary creations. That these aren't really people who endured this kind of thing. You and I, everybody who believes in Jesus Christ, stands on a long line of people who have lived for the faith and suffered things that you and I can't imagine. Okay, and here are people, just as an example, he's referring to them, he says, look, he encourages them to remain firm in the faith. Okay, this is, the, this is remember, this is what, the setting of the letter. People are being tempted to turn, and he's going to, he's urging them to remain firm. And he's doing that here, urging them to remain firm in the faith by calling them to remember their past commitment. Okay, he's calling them to remember their past commitment. The earlier time of hardship where they had endured, of the earlier time of hardship that they had endured after they'd received the gospel. These folks had undergone some time earlier some real persecution. Some had personally experienced public ridicule and persecution. Okay, I haven't experienced it. You know, maybe somebody laugh at you kind of thing. But, you know, not this kind of stuff. These guys are experiencing public ridicule and persecution, and others had suffered through their solidarity with brothers and sisters who had been treated that way. And so earlier at some point they had suffered, they cared for their fellow saints in prison, and they accepted with joy the confiscation of their property. Now what if the government bops in, which smells to me like it's not as far off as it once was, what if the government bops in and says, listen, we've decided that you Christians are enemies of the peace of the society. You're disruptive, you got this nerve, you, you, you're calling certain people that they're engaged in sinful activity. You're making judgments about people, you're disturbing the peace of the community. You shouldn't be allowed to say those things, talk those things. In fact, we're going to outlaw you, and in fact, we're going to take all your property. Your car's gone, your house is gone. You're going to be sitting there going, what are you talking about? Hey, baby, this is the way it is. We're taking it. Now, imagine that that's happening. That happened to some of these people, and what did he say? They accepted with joy the confiscation of their property. Now, they accepted that with joy. Now, that's pretty powerful. Okay, that's pretty powerful, and he explains why. Now, what I think he's talking about here, by the way, with a number of uh, commentators, with Bruce and uh, William Lane and Donald Hagner, I think he's probably, he say, well, when was this mistreatment? If this reconstruction is correct, that he's writing to a uh, predominantly Jewish house church or two in, in uh, Rome in the mid-60s, well, when would this have occurred? Well, with, the, with a number of commentators, I think it's probably a reference to mistreatment that took place around the time of Claudius's expulsion, Emperor Claudius's expulsion of the Jews from Rome in A.D. 49. Okay, which expulsion is referred to in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. Now, the Roman historian Suetonius, okay, they had historians, right? Well, Suetonius is a Roman historian who lived from A.D. 69 to 140. He says about this event, about Claudius' expulsion, he writes a history of Rome, and when he gives you the account, why did Claudius boot the Jews from Rome? Well, he says that Claudius did it because, quote, they constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, end quote. Now, most scholars recognize that that reference to Crestus is a reference to Christ, and the Jews were expelled, see, because the conflict between Jewish disciples of Christ and Jews who rejected him as the Messiah was causing a disturbance. You understand from the book of Acts, right, that a lot of times the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, they weren't too kind toward those who accepted him. There was turmoil, and they didn't like turmoil, okay? So there was this turmoil going on in Rome, and so he gives the Jews the boot. He says, I'm expelling you from Rome. Okay, now, though they're all indiscriminately because Christianity wasn't formally distinguished from Judaism at that point by the Roman government, he just brooms them all. 
But from the way Suetonius describes this, where he says the disturbance is at the instigation of Crestus, it gives you a hint that the real bad guy was seen as those who were, you know, making noise because of Christ. Okay, so they're getting the broom, they're getting kicked out, and uh, they were the focal point. Let me read to you what William Lane says. He says, the size of the Jewish community in Rome made it impossible to enforce the decree completely. But certainly both Jewish and Jewish Christian leadership had been affected. Sporadic persecution of those who remained undoubtedly followed. In the case of the Jewish Christian leaders Aquila and Priscilla, the Claudian decree meant banishment from Rome and almost certainly the loss of property. Others in the same house church experienced various indignities, including imprisonment, injury, and deprivation for the sake of their commitment to Christ. Okay, so this is something that they're experiencing, and the writer is telling them, look back to how you were. Look back to how passionate you were. Look back to what you were willing to endure. Have you had that in your life? Have you had a time in your life where you were more jazzed, more on fire, where you were willing to walk the plank for Christ, so to speak? You were willing to suffer and say, listen, I will not deny him. I will not do anything that I don't think he wants me to do, and I don't care what the consequences are. If it means my job, if it means this, I'm not going to do it. I'm simply not going to do it. I remember many years ago, I had a fellow I worked with, love him to death, still a dear friend of mine. He was a senior partner in our law firm. And he had some deal he wanted to do where uh, he wanted me to call in. When you're calling from out of my call in and ask for yourself. And somehow then he'd call you back and it was saving money or something. And I said, you know, I'm not going to do that. I said, it looks to me like you're cheating the phone company. And he got furious with me. And I just said, I'm not going to do it. And he let me know. He said, okay. But he got angry with me. But I think he knew I was right. But see, that's just a trivial thing. But you've had things in your life, and he's calling them back to the time. Now, here they are being pressured, and you've got people jumping ship, fleeing the scene. And he says, go back to there. You remember how you were, how you were enduring this stuff? Light the fire. Isn't that what we sing? Light the fire? We're saying, hey, light the fire. Look at what, what you endured and what you were holding on to. Okay, they, you know, let me read to you what Guthrie says. This is George Guthrie. Now get this, he says, A key to the author's use of his hearer's past stance as a present example is the attitude of joy attendant on these circumstances. This manner in which they accepted the theft of their properties describes a spiritual condition by which one sees and celebrates greater realities than those immediately observable. The hearers had joy in the midst of their persecution because they knew that better and lasting possessions were promised them by virtue of their identification with the Lord and His church. You see, that's what drives this. Somebody who's willing to endure these things because what? He's looking up here. He says, listen, my allegiance and faith to Christ, there is in store for me something that transcends whatever you take of mine. It transcends all of that. But you see, that has to be a real conviction. That has to be, and if it is, this flows out of it. That's why I think when you're talking about holding people, you cannot tinker. You need serious surgery. Okay, we can't mess with, well, can I draw people by painting the wall blue? Will that get people here? Yeah, they like the cool colors. You, see, you have to get them to see Christ. You have to get them to see what this is. We are not the Rotary Club. Okay, we're not a social club that gets together and smiles and nods and says, aren't we wonderful? We are the body of Christ. Redeemed. Committed. Following Jesus Christ. This is a radical work that is being done by God, and we're part of it. I've said many times. You don't find revolutionary somewhere, right? If you think there's a revolution going on, what do you find? What are the revolutionaries about? They eat, breathe, and sleep the revolution. That's what drives them. I've read to you before the letter from the communist who sits here and says, listen, it's my life, it's my girlfriend, I eat it, I breathe it. That's what Christianity is. It's God's revolution. It's His revolution. 
And we are participants in that revolution. And we got to get people to see that. Get people to see that. Okay? And you'll go a long way. How are you going to keep people? That's how. That's how. To see the reality of this. And he's telling them, look at what you endured. And they had this idea, you see, they saw better and lasting possessions. And that's what we need to see. You and I have that in store for us. You and I have this glorious reality. You and I have something that's bigger, greater, superior than all that this world can offer. Do not allow those things to cause you to surrender your commitment to Christ as the enemy sits here and says, I'm going to take your car. I'm going to take your house. I'm going to throw you in jail. Well, what, what is the saint's response supposed to be? You know, I don't pray for that. I don't sit here and say, well, great, that's wonderful. But if God, you call me to walk that way, give me the strength to be faithful and to honor you in all things, whether in life or death. I want to honor you. I want to honor you, whether life or death. And so here, you know, they're taking things. They're doing all that. And he says, look, uh, you know, go ahead. We have this, we have this example. All right, let me go on uh, 32 through 39. He says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You have need of endurance then, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet in a very little while, the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. He's referring to, he's, it's a, he's quoting from Isaiah 26 and Habakkuk. He says, but we are not people of timidity resulting in destruction, but of faith resulting in the saving of the soul. Okay, here he says, look, he's encouraging these saints who are under pressure not to retreat from their earlier pattern of public identification with Christ. See, not to be intimidated into disassociating from Christ or the body of Christ. Don't allow these, social, these pressures and these things to cause you to deny Jesus. Okay, don't let that happen. He's appealing to them not to do that. If they remain faithful to Christ, they will receive the promised blessings of salvation. If they abandon him, they will receive condemnation. Okay, that's it. That's the truth of the matter. So we encourage one another to be faithful. Now, verses 37 to 38... There is somewhat free citation to the Septuagint version of Isaiah 26, 20 and 21, Habakkuk 2, 3 and 4. Now, which text the Hebrew writer, he's conflated to make one statement. And he forges these texts into an appeal to endure in faithfulness in light of the fact Christ will come in a little while. At which time their eternal destiny will be sealed according to their faithfulness or their lack thereof. Now, nobody knows when Christ is coming. Okay, he says that clearly, you see it in Matthew 24, 36, Mark 13, 32. But whatever time he's set for that coming will not be delayed. Now, the statement that he'll come in a very little while is best understood from the perspective of the eternal state that his coming will usher in. You see, however long until his return, whether it be days or whether it be millennia, it will be a very little while compared to that eternal state that his coming will usher in. After all, the very text that he cites, they were written centuries earlier. Let me say just one other thing here. He says, you know, Paul, for example, Paul can describe his sufferings as what? As momentary. Decades of suffering. What does he say? Momentary. In light of an eternal perspective. In 2 Corinthians 4.17, James can describe a human lifespan as a little time. Okay? The Hebrew writer, just as they can do that, the Hebrew writer can describe an unknown but finite time until Christ's return is a very little while. Peter applies that same concept. Right? In 2 Peter, when the idea was, well, where is this coming he promised? He, he applies that very same concept about the length of time till Christ's return. He says, look, alluding to Psalm 90, verse 4, he says in 2 Peter 3, 8, from God's standpoint of eternity, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. Okay, so that's what I think that he's talking about here. There is a finite time which will usher in an eternity. And when you and I look back on that, it's that, baby. When you and I, from that standpoint of eternity, look back on whatever this time is. Lifetime, it's a little time. Decades, it's a moment. 
Okay, whatever that time is, it's going to be the blink of an eye, and we will then experience eternity. Eternity, okay? He's encouraging. Well, thank you for hanging on a little bit beyond the bell. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>